what we're seeing now is that there was a, there's been a huge focus on ensuring that everyone who lives with HIV in um, sub-Saharan Africa has access to treat to testing treatment and 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 enough services, including the treatment, to ensure viral suppression so that the HIV is untransmissible. So what we what the data is telling us that in sub-Saharan Africa, 84% in our region, 84% of people living with HIV have access to treatment who are over 15. They have received treatment and 94% of those who are on treatment have, have been able to keep it suppressed so it's untransmissible. So it becomes treatment as prevention. Um, and so I think what is behind the success in African countries is that immense political attention that was given to HIV. And then we also have to admit that we have had huge investments from our partners, particularly from PEPFAR, the US government, um, as well as from the Global Fund, who are funded by you know, countries of the North as well as countries of the South. So there has been major investments. Uh, and so in some countries, up to 99% of the HIV response is externally funded. Um, but with time, we're seeing that dwindling. But these are the things that have created such a heavy, um, you know, such excellent results that we are seeing. I think it's important to note that aggregate data always masks the differences, right? And so we need to be able to also talk about while we've made immense progress, we have some countries that are lagging. So we have countries who, uh, whether it's because of civil war um, or it's because of humanitarian challenges, or just for some reason, there wasn't a lot of attention given to the country. Countries like South Sudan, Angola, Madagascar, Mauritius, Seychelles, countries who, Comoros, who had been in the lead previously, like Mauritius, are barely at 50% of the treatment targets. Thanks, Anne. I'm going to ask you about what you want the world to know. As we speak in 2024, HIV AIDS is the world's deadliest pandemic. We have been able to defeat COVID-19, but HIV <coughs> AIDS is still a conversation we're having uh, at this time. So I think the one big thing that we are talking about and the message we're giving in this report is that, um, you know, this the reason we're saying we're at a crossroads is that we are at a point where we need to make some very, very critical decisions that will determine whether we are able to achieve the target of ending AIDS as a public health threat by 2030. So we, we, we all agreed, and I mean all member states across the world, agreed as part of the Sustainable Development Goals to end AIDS as a public health threat by 2030. But to be able to do this, we need to be able to fully resource the response. And what we have seen is that there has been shrinking donor resources. We've seen a widening funding gap as other priorities come on board, whether it was COVID or the poly crises that are happening in countries, the war in Ukraine or the Middle East and, you know, attention given away, the migration issues that the donor countries are much more concerned about. And so increasingly resources being driven away from HIV and also because of the great success, in some ways we are victims of our success in so doing so well, and, you know, turn our attention away. And we are saying, stay focused, stay focused. We are not there yet. Data around children is really troubling in the UNAIDS data report. Um, the title of the report itself is The Net Urgency of Now. And I, and I think what the report really details is the lack of urgency that we've seen around dealing with issues around pediatric HIV. Uh, for example, the report very clearly shows that, you know, that children are at one out of every 10 new infections which is really high this far into the epidemic. And there's also an outsource, outsized mor mortality issue around children. So, you know, children make up 3% of the HIV uh, infected population, but they represent 12% of deaths. And so this is something we're really tracking. I don't want to under, I don't want to ignore the good news too. Uh, I think that we've seen a real, the report details a huge increase in treatment coverage for adults. And in fact, for the first time in history, um, there are more new infections outside of Sub-Saharan Africa than inside Sub-Saharan Africa. So, you know, the treatment coverage and the story about how many 31 million people now on treatment is something to really applaud. But the key message here, I think, is that while the progress we've seen is outstanding, it's really still pretty uneven, particularly when it comes to children. Let's talk about the unevenness and inequity. Why do they still exist? 
Well, you know, children aren't just little adults, right? Um, children can't take themselves to clinics. Children often don't even know they've been exposed to HIV. And so they really rely on the caregivers, parents, community around them to ensure not just that they get identified as being HIV exposed and potentially HIV positive, but you know, also getting the support that they need to, to maintain their health even if they are on treatment. So, you know, one of the stats that always has sort of troubled us is that, you know, only half of children, uh, are only a little over half of children are on treatment, and under half of those children are virally suppressed, which means they're at much higher risk for illness there and they're much higher risk for death. And so it really does take everyone who touches a child's life to sort of take responsibility for making sure that they're getting the, the treatment, the diagnosis, and the care that they need.